We'll come to church. Come on, put your hands together. Has God been good to you? Mari wa kanaka, 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 mari wa kanaka.
cause you never give up, you never give up for me. Oh, what joy I find because of your love, because of your love for me. Oh, my God, so good, you never give up, you never give up for me. Oh, what joy I find because of your love, because of your love for me.
because of your love for me. Oh my God, so good. You never give up. You never give up for me. Oh, what joy I find because of your love, because of your love for me. Never made a promise you couldn't keep. 
just declare this truth of our hearts and of our land of the living that our God is faithful in the land of the living every word that he has begun our God is a faithful God that he remembers his covenant of love to the thousands of generations to those that love him
Hallelujah. God, we bless your name this morning. Oh, how we love you. Thank you, God, for being faithful, reliable, dependable, the God who will never change. You've never failed. Your track record is still flawless, God. You are a miracle worker. God, we worship you and we bless your name in this place. God, we've witnessed so many different things that you've done in our lives and we just want to say thank you, Lord. Oh, how we love you. I will bless your name, Jesus. You're worthy, worthy, worthy of all glory, of all honor. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. We honor your name, Jesus. Oh, thank you, God. We're still witnessing it because you haven't changed. And you are faithful in every circumstance, God. In every situation, God. Oh, God, we worship you in this place. We lift your name on high. You are worthy, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. We bless your name this morning. We thank you, God, for your faithfulness. Thank you, God. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Just give him some worship, some praise. Hallelujah. Yes, he's worthy of it. Hallelujah, hallelujah. All right, before you sit down, please greet your neighbor. Let them feel welcome. Hallelujah. All right. Now, if you have come here to fellowship with us for the very first time, we want to give you an MLFC welcome. Amen. So, if you are here for the very first time, will you kindly just wave your hand? We just want to appreciate you. I see that hand over here. I see that hand over there. I see that hand. Hallelujah. Thank you. I see that hand. Thank you so much. Our visitors, if you didn't make a stop at the Welcome Center, which is located to my left, as you exit the doors at the back there with a pop-up banner that says, First Time Guests, please do so at the end of the service. We just want to connect with you, get to know you a little bit more, and answer any questions that you may have about Miracle Life Family Church. One more time, let's just appreciate them. Thank you for spending time with us this morning. Amen. All right, this morning we have a funeral announcement. 
Lumba Mova, age two, passed away on Thursday, 18th April, and was put to rest on Friday, 19th April. His parents are members of the Chelston Palm Drive Connection Group. Please keep them in your prayers, support them, especially those within that zone, that connection group. And we know that you're doing that already, and that's really commendable. And life is a whole lot better when you're doing it with other believers. Amen. Even burdens like this, actually you go through them. Not that they, it just eliminates any sadness or anything, but it's a whole lot better when you have people that you're doing life with. Amen. So let's keep them in our prayers and keep encouraging them. This morning we do have a wedding announcement. And we're going to have a couple standing up. Parkson Kalanga is going to wed Gladys Luizzi on Saturday 20, 27th April at 10 hours in the MLFC chapel. Would you kindly just stand up so we can see you? That's our couple right there. <laughs> Thank you so much for including us in your process. We love it and we appreciate it. That's why we clap and celebrate everyone who stands up there. It's because we love it when we see couples doing it the right way. So God bless you. We love you. We support you. And may he go before you and surround you in everything. Amen. One more time, let's just appreciate them. <clears throat> Church, I now invite your attention to the screens for the video announcements. Top of the morning, Miracle Life Family Church. These are your announcements for this week. The Character of God class outlines the nature of God and also shows how we can live in a relationship with Him. Join School for Life for the Character of God class on Saturday, 4th May from 9 hours to 12 hours in Classroom 3. Sign up at the School for Life table outside the foyer or via our website or the mobile app. We invite you to join us for weekly prayer sessions which take place here at Miracle Life Family Church every day. To sign up, visit the School for Life table outside the foyer. The next child dedication will take place on Sunday, 19th May. Please note that parents wishing to dedicate their children are required to go through a once-off pre-child dedication parents class on Saturday, 11th May from 9 hours to 11 hours in Classroom 3. Sign up via our website or the mobile app by Tuesday, 30th April. Men, get ready for this year's Brave Men's Conference! Join us on Saturday, 8th June at Miracle Life Family Church from 9 hours to 18 hours. This year, we have a powerhouse lineup of speakers ready to inspire, empower, and equip you for greatness. Don't miss out on the wisdom and insight of Pastor Walker Schurz, Pastor Afrika Mflope, and Bishop Harrison Sakala. Mark your calendars and be there to experience a day that could change everything. The ticket cost is 200 kwacha and tickets bought after... Sunday the 2nd of June will not include lunch. Sign up at the Brave Table outside the foyer, the bookshop during the week, or via our website or the mobile app. Ladies, if you would like to serve, sign up at the Brave Table outside the foyer after the service. For more information about what's happening at Miracle Life Family Church, be sure to check out the bulletin tab on the mobile app, visit our website, and follow us on social media. Enjoy the rest of the service. All right, we're going to receive tithes and offerings, and ashes are in the aisles to assist you if you need to, if you want to designate the, your giving, just indicate by raising your hand, and they'll be glad to assist you. There are various channels. Uh, we have mobile options, MTN, Airtel, Zamtel. You can do a, uh, a bank transfer, direct bank transfer, or you can also make use of the giving booth there in the foyer or the SEP deposit box that's available to you even during the week. Amen. All right, so um, we're going to read Matthew 6, verse 19 to 21. It 
it reads, do not lay up treasures, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroys and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, Jesus is not dismissing the importance of securing things, you know, investing and, you know, saving and all of the principles to do with finances. He's just taking things to another level in this, when he says, do not lay up treasures for yourselves here. Now, this is extracted from the Sermon on the Mount, which is the longest sermon. And in this sermon, Jesus is actually taking things to another level. He's inculcating a kingdom mindset. It's in this same sermon where he says that Moses told you, Moses said in the law, do not commit adultery. But I say that if you look at a woman lustfully, then you've committed adultery in your heart. So that's what he's doing every time he says something. He wants them to understand that there are things that we do in the natural that have got eternal impact. He doesn't want them to just end at just understanding things right here on earth, but he's saying that our giving does have eternal effect, eternal implications, and he's inviting them to a new way of thinking about treasures, that when you actually add value, when you have a kingdom mindset and you give of your treasures here on earth, you are actually investing in the heavenly bank, and that's a big, big, wonderful, beautiful thing to understand that there's eternal value to my giving today. Amen. And we are adding to the furtherance of the gospel and that we are causing for there to be souls saved because somebody is going and preaching through our giving. How wonderful is that? And we get to participate in it. Amen. So I invite you to this understanding. Some of you understand it already, and I invite you once again to realize and consider the fact that you are actually investing or depositing into the heavenly bank as you give this morning. And it's a wonderful thing. Amen. So let us pray before we give. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are doing something with our natural earthly thing you have caused it to abound and to to cause it to be so fruitful that it affects eternity oh god almighty thank you so much that you have chosen for us to participate in the things that you are accomplishing here on earth oh god almighty lord bless the giving of the saints bless the gift and the giver this morning we give you all of the glory and all of the honor today in jesus name we have prayed amen My name is Mwaza Banda, Mrs. Banda, and this is my husband, Kamanga Banda. Or my boyfriend. <laughs> The way we benefited from the Marriage Builders course was something that actually impacted our marriage. Because before the course, we would have challenges, especially when it comes to spending time with your partner. But through the course, we got to learn and discover to say that you can do quite a lot with your partner. The time that you set for kids and other priorities, also prioritize your partner because that is what should come first. It, it actually made us see things differently. Because the only thing that we had for understanding towards marriage was whatever we were taught when, before we got married, exactly. which was the uh, traditional teachings and so on. Mm -hmm. But uh, when we were exposed to this other one, we, we you know, it changed our thinking on how we understand and uh, approach different things. Okay. Even just how we carry ourselves is now different. Because it before is. it was, uh, yes, uh, uh, culturally, it's you would say uh, you are the man of the house, everybody does this, but that seemed more or less like it was an instruction. 
and uh, you've got it's like you are an army commander and then you've got all these soldiers around you but with Am the I builders, a I'm just saying. <laughs> uh, it's an example I'm using. Okay. Yeah. So when we came for the uh, marriage course, you know, it changed how we look at things, and uh, it helped us to understand that uh, yes, you lead the family, but you also engage the family to work with you, and we've learned uh, to sort out problems as they come. Whenever there's an issue or I do something wrong, she does something wrong, I expect her to tell me there and then. It shouldn't take three days, four days, one week, and there's just picture, no sound. You're all just walking past each other, no. If I did something wrong today, sit me down. You actually even make a very big meal. After I finish eating, say, oh, you're full? Yes, okay, now let's sit here. Remember what you did, eh? this, 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 I was not happy. Oh, sorry, sorry for that. Why mm-hmm. I did this was A, B, C, D, sorry, sorry. Okay. Every equally herself. There um, came a point after the uh, marriage builders uh, session where we got to say, "This is not a job, number one. This is us. That we are actually together in this. Let's have fun." Let us love more. Let us also ex- explore other things that we uh, thought is uh, hidden, as sort of to say. So um, it really uh, opened up our mind, and uh, we got some tips to say no. When it comes to money, you need to plan and you need to do this and this. Don't be a shorthand and all that. So we actually are giving each other responsibilities, and we are also. Um, teaching up our children to say this is the way you should actually do uh, and conduct yourselves. As a husband, it has helped me, you know, to exercise my role as a leader in the family to, you know, to lead and set examples for myself, my wife and the kids and you know to lead everybody and myself into a spiritual uh, uh, alignment and also to grow together as a family. It really is a blessing so please 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 make sure you join uh, this uh, seminar you don't want to miss out on what we are experiencing. Mm. It's love 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 everywhere. Love it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. How many of you know that if you have a motor vehicle, you, you take it for repair, adjustment, balancing? And so marriage is, there's a lot of potholes and things that can injure us and, and get us out of alignment. And so all of these types of resources that are at Miracle Life, whether it's a short-term seminar or a meeting or things like Marriage Builders, the next one will be in September. They are for you and they're for your family and um, invest in your future. And sometimes you think, well, uh, you know, our marriage isn't terrible. Good. Well, it can, it can go from a, a, a seven to an eight if you, if you keep investing in God's word. Amen? All right. We've got a guest speaker with us today, Evangelist Christopher Alam. And I want to read, yes, amen. I want to read a scripture to you in Ephesians chapter 4. It says, speaking of Jesus, it said that he ascended. Does it mean that he also first descended in the lower parts of the earth? He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all heavens that he might fill all things. And he himself, Jesus, after he ascended, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. And so the evangelist, that, that uh, Evangelist Christopher Lom, that office that he stands in, that the, the work that he does is many, many times outside of the local church, reaching unsafe people. And so he and his team are in Zimbabwe for the next couple of weeks doing some awesome crusades. They've been all over Zambia, Mozambique, Malawi, this whole region. 
But what we see here from the word of God is an evangelist has a role to equip us as believers, to help us to become more fruitful, to become more effective. And I, I enjoy being under the, the ministry of the evangelist, but I want you to open up your heart today to let God equip you. Let God expand you. Let, let God deposit some things in your heart that will come through this office that doesn't necessarily come through the office of a pastor or a teacher. Amen? So let's open up our hearts and let's give a big, big warm welcome to Evangelist Christopher Alam. We're so glad that he's here. Thank you, Pastor Walker, for your kind words. I was hoping you'd introduce me as a prophet or something, but <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. Let's stand up and pray together. Father, we honor you. We glorify you this morning. Lord Jesus, first of all, we thank you for everything that you did for us upon the cross. Thank you, Lord, for all that you have done for us. And Lord, we worship you this morning. We thank you for your holy word, which is able to impart life unto us, faith unto us, and to transform us and to take us from faith to faith, from glory to glory. And so, Lord, we open our hearts to receive our portion this morning. I ask you that you would touch our hearts and also let your word go forth with power and do your transforming work in us and touch those who don't know you, heal those that are sick, do miracles in this place. And, Lord, for everything you do in our lives, we give you all the glory, the honor, and the praise because you alone are worthy. In the name of Jesus, amen. Please be seated. I'm honored to be here. Praise God. Praise God. Well, the Lord is good, and his mercies endure forever. Praise God. Praise God. Um, thank you, Pastor Walker, for uh, actually I invited myself. So thank you for having me for today. I came yesterday. I was in Singapore, and now I'm headed to South Africa tomorrow and then to Zimbabwe. We got two crusades in uh, Ambari and Chetinguiza in, uh, uh, in, in Harare. So we're doing this year. Uh, you know, uh, our base is in Harare in Zimbabwe. But um, um, for the past seven, eight years, we have not done anything in Zim because of the political situation was so bad. And uh, it was very difficult. You know, we didn't know whether they would allow any gatherings. And, and then it was, there was a time it was impossible to buy diesel. I mean, it was a very, very bad situation. So we were here, mostly in Zimbabwe and in Mozambique. So, but I finally said to the team, let's do it anyway. We'll find a way to do it. And then there was a cholera epidemic around the, in the Harare area. So we decided to go anyway. So uh, we just got our permit uh, on Friday to do the crusade, which starts on Tuesday. So, uh, because we needed per uh, permits from the health department, from the police, but we have managed to get all that. So all that is done. Praise the Lord for that. Because, uh, you know, authorities are hard to work with. Uh, here they're easy. Zambia has always been good and easy for us. But anyway, so it has been good. Um, last year we finished very well in Africa. We went to uh, we, we were in Mozambique and uh, we were in Zambia. We were, mo we were all our crusades were in the northern province last year and I'd never been there before. And uh, one place, I think that was on Pulungu, and you know, there's only one airport. The closest airport, I think, was 450 kilometers away. So uh, we, we had to rent a little plane. Uh, that flew us there. So there was one pastor with me from America. He was like, I think 200 kilos. He was a big guy. <laughs> so he and I were kind of sitting cramped together for three hours in that plane. And then we landed and we had, uh, we had a crusade there. And then we were in uh, two different towns that was, uh, what, what was that city where that airport is? Kasama, close to Kasama. So we went to one town, and when I and before I went there, Bishop David Nama, who is a friend of mine, told me he said, "Brother, that's the capital of witchcraft <laughs> in Zambia." Now you know I live in America. In America, witchcraft is when you have a difficult mother-in-law. That's uh, 
that's uh, you know, people sometimes go, you know, my mother-in-law, oh, that's witchcraft, you know, that's <laughs> spiritual, she is, she, or it's either witchcraft or it's the spirit of Jezebel, one of the, one, one of the two, the difficult mother, but here, I mean, witchcraft is witchcraft, you know, so when I landed, <laughs> <laughs> the first crusade, they told me there was a famous witch doctor there, and they said that the police were scared of him, and the pastors were scared of him, because he used to put a spell on people and they just died. I mean, he could kill people. He could just put a, I wish I could do that with some difficult people, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but he could just put a spell on somebody and they would die. And so the the, everybody was scared of him, and uh, so anyway, so uh, I, I just heard that there was such a man. I didn't know who he was, what he looked like, but what I didn't know, he showed up at the crusade one night, and uh, actually he, he came the night before my team told me. He tried every night to get on the platform pretending he had a testimony, and anyway, so one night he got on, and he came on the platform. I didn't know who he was, and and so instead of saying testimony, he, he said something to the crowd in the local language and the whole crowd laughed. I think he just wanted to mock us and get everyone to laugh. So everybody laughed. And as he was leaving the platform, my team leader said to me, now I, he, uh, he said that you pointed your finger at him and said it's a dangerous thing to mock the spirit of God. So anyway, he walked home and when he came home, he dropped dead and he died. And I tell you, the fear of God came on the town. And we had a big crusade after that. And a lot of people were saved and healed. So, you know, that was good. Then we went to a place called Gorongosa in, uh, in Mozambique. And when we came there, uh, that was the, they told me that this is the first ever crusade held in this area. Because Gorongosa was the headquarters of the Frelimo guerrillas who had been fighting the government for, I think, 40 years, you know. And uh, it was very hard to get into Gorongosa, so I had to fly in in one of the small safari planes. And it landed on a grassy field. There was no runway there. It was a big grassy field. And before I landed, my team was watching. They said a guy with a motorcycle came, chased away all the baboons and everybody so the plane could land. So anyway, so we had that crusade there. And Gorongosa is a very small place. If you look at it on Google Earth, it's just a, a collection of houses. But we had a full field there. The football ground was packed. People came from 40 kilometers away. And, they, and so we went to see the district administrator, the guy of the whole area, and he was a strong Pentecostal. And what I found out that when he came, you know, Mozambique is very corrupt. So when they appointed him district administrator, he fired everybody who was not Pentecostal. <laughs> he fired the police, everybody, everybody in government who was not tongue talking, he fired them. And he put Pentecostals there. And you know, as a result, there was no corruption. Nobody asked us for any bribes. It was, it was wonderful. So, and he told me, he said, Pastor, this is the first time ever anyone is preaching the gospel here because this week Frelimo is laying down its arms and making peace with the government. And we had a fantastic crusade there. People came walking 30, 40 kilometers away and we had a fantastic crusade and God did a wonderful thing there. And there were village pastors from, uh, I mean, they were from all over the place. So we asked them, is there anything we can do for you? They said, we want Bibles. So we managed to buy several hundred Bibles for this village pastor. So God is doing a good thing. Praise God. God is doing a good thing everywhere. Then after that, a couple of weeks ago, actually a month ago, I was in Beirut in Lebanon. And, you know, just an hour and a half away from where we were, Hezbollah and Israel were fighting and shooting rockets at each other. And here we were in the city and preaching the gospel, people were getting saved, people were getting healed. The Catholics let us use their place to hold the crusade, and they gave us all the help we could. So it's a, you know, it's, it's a difficult time, but it's also a fantastic time. You know, there's two sides to it. It's a, it's a difficult time in the world, but it's also a good time. It's also a fantastic time. Praise God. Amen. Praise God. Well, 
Zechariah chapter 13, verse 1. So Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah, he lived 400 years before Christ. Zechariah was the last prophet of the Old Testament. He was the last prophet of the Old Testament. And uh, he lived 400 years before Christ. Now, Zechariah's book is not the last book of the Old Testament. The last book is Malachi, but you must remember that the books of the Bible are not all in chronological order. But Zechariah was the last prophet. He lived 400 years before Christ. And this is uh, a word that he spoke. It says in Zechariah 13 verse 1, In that day there shall be a fountain open to the house of David and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem for sin and for uncleanness. He's saying that God is going to open, actually the word fountain here in the Hebrew means a spring or a river. He said God is going to open a river. He's going to open a spring that is for the cleansing of sin and for uncleanness. Now, this is very significant because if you want to understand why he said God is going to open a spring or a river, in the days of the Bible, you know, people didn't have running water in their homes. People didn't have taps in their homes like we have. So there were basically two sources of water. One was the river or, or, and the spring. The other was the well. Now, a well was the place where people went to fetch drinking water. You know, so people kept drinking water in wells and that water always, uh, I mean, drinking water in their homes and that water always came from a well because it was clean water from under the ground. But a spring or a river, that was the place where people went to take a bath. That was the place people went to wash their clothes. So a spring or a river was a place of cleansing, but a well was a place of drinking. Now, if you look at religions in general, I grew up as a Muslim, you know, every religion has a concept of holy water of some kind. So, for example, the best example I would have is like the Hindus in India. They, they have a river called the Ganges. It's a, it's a huge river. It is so wide in places that you can't see the other side of the river. It's a very wide river. And the Ganges is, cons is considered to be a holy river. That's a, a holy river. And the Hindus believe that every Hindu must dip in the Ganges at least once in his lifetime, and that would cleanse him of his sins. So every year, millions of people make the pilgrimage to the Ganges. They go walking to the Ganges and to take a dip in that river, supposed to be a holy river. Now, I grew up as a Muslim, and Muslims have a holy spring in Mecca called the Zamzam, and that holy spring, the waters of that spring are supposed to do some cleansing work in you. My dad was a general in the army, so he had contacts. He always kept tanks of that holy water from Mecca in our home. And uh, especially when the kids were naughty or we had exa exams coming up, he would mix it in our bath water. So I took baths in that holy water many, many times. And uh, my experience was from that, if you were to ask me, well, what did that holy water from Mecca do to you? I tell you what it did. It did one thing. I know it, it, the only thing it can do is to turn a dry sinner into a wet sinner. It doesn't, it doesn't have the power to, to cleanse you in any way. So then, of course, there are churches. You go to churches and they have holy water consecrated by the priest or the bishop. And if you go there and you say, I would like have some holy water, they'll bring some holy water and they'll sprinkle you because people believe in these things. So every religion has a concept of holy water because water has cleansing property. So water, if you go to a spring or a river, it cleanses the outer man. But here he's talking about a spring or a river that's going to cleanse the inner man that's going to cleanse the inner man. Because you see, when you stand before man, the Bible says that man looks at the outward appearance, 
but God looks at the heart. Man looks at the and 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 so you know in a in a in 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 societies where Christians where, where where let me put it this way in societies where Christianity is accepted and respected where there is no persecution for being a Christian where it's easy to be a Christian Christianity is used by a lot of people to disguise a sinful life where people can go to churches and yet be sinful and they can say I'm a Christian especially during election time politicians like to be seen with pastors and go, go to churches carrying a Bible so people say you know this is a Christian man I'm going to vote for him of course nobody in Zambia does that but I know I, I know in other countries they they you know they they do that but 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 here's the thing is that uh, um, God looks at the heart because all man can see is a person's uh, outward appearance and outward behavior but God looks at the heart and God can you know you can fool man but you can never fool God because it says that do not be deceived because God will not be mocked what a man sows he shall reap so there's that sowing and reaping and we can never get away from that and uh, and the reason some people do that they they go on deceiving deceiving because they don't live their lives with an eternal perspective they think of today okay i will do this today and i will gain this today but they don't think of the eternal consequences of that what's going to happen in the future what will happen before when i stand before god you know and and because people don't live with that consciousness of eternity but in the bible it's all about eternity jesus is all about eternity it talks about giving us the gift of eternal life so it's it's all about eternity and it's it's time that we started thinking of eternity and thinking of the consequences of our life you know uh, i just turned 70 years old and uh, I'm thinking, I know, uh, you know, the last year I've lost uh, friends, uh, pastors, who, men of God who have, uh, who have gone on to be with Jesus. A few days ago, I lost a man, uh, I, we lost a brother who I respected very greatly, who I knew personally, Dr. Jerry Savell. And he went home to be with Jesus. And, and uh, you know, I was... Uh, I thought of him, I thought of his life, and I didn't think of his ministry per se, like how big his ministry was, but I thought of his walk with God, what he was like, and, and I thought now he's gone, and then I was thinking, where is he? Well, he's with Jesus, there's no question about that, and I thought to myself, that's where I want to be, I want to be with Jesus. You know, I want to, when I, when I enter into heaven, uh, it, it won't matter whether your ministry is big or small. The only thing matter is how you walked here. Uh, and and you, you want to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. Well done, good and faithful servant. So, those, you know, eternal consequences. So, Zechariah says that he's going to, that God is going to open a fountain that shall be for the cleanse, uh, cleansing of sin and of uncleanness. So, I want to talk about that spring, that fountain today. What is that fountain? What is that spring that cleanses the human heart from all sin and uncleanness? Now, so that is why Jesus came into this world 400 years after Zechariah said these words. And, but to understand Jesus, understand the birth of Jesus, we have to go right to the beginning when God created man. The Bible says God created man out of the dust of the earth. He created Adam out of clay. And then it says that he breathed upon Adam. And that word breath is actually ruach, which means spirit. So the breath of God, the spirit of God. So the spirit, God breathed his own spirit upon Adam. And Adam, being, Adam became a living being. So Adam had the life of God. And that's why it says that, you know, God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness. So Adam had the life of God. Now, Adam had the life of God, but the life, his life was in his blood. Because in the book of Leviticus, chapter 19, it says that the life of all flesh is in the blood. So, the, and, and your life is in your blood. So, Adam's life, the life he received from God 
was in his blood. But when Adam and Eve sinned against God, that was the first case of blood contamination, blood poisoning. Sin entered into his genes. And then since that day, every human being who has been born of Adam, who carries his bloodline, has been born in sin. And that's why David said, it says, in sin was I born, and in sin did my mother conceive me. He, he, you know, he knew that. He, he realized that. I was born in sin. Not because I sinned, but I was born in sin. And I was conceived in sin. And we all carry. You know, the unique thing is that there are 8 billion people on this earth. And all of us, we are related by blood. Whether you're African or white or Chinese or whatever you may be, we all descend from Adam. So we are all cousins in some way. You know, you can go and tell I'm Christopher Allen's cousin. So, so we, are, we, we are all cousins in some way. And we are all related. But, and, the, and the thing is that because of that, we all carry Adam's genes. We all carry his sin. And so, and every human does that. Now, so you have to remember that. So that is why man is separated from God. Because, because we have those genes of sin. That was not intended by God, but received it. We received it through Adam. So into this picture came Jesus, and that's why the virgin birth is so important. Now, Jesus did not have... Now, these are very basic things, but it's very important for us to understand this. Jesus was not, did not have a human father. God picked a virgin called Mary, and the angel came and spoke the word over Mary and Mary conceived. So Jesus was born of the, he was conceived of the word and the spirit of God. So Jesus, he was nine months in the womb of Mary. Now when, now any, any medical person, any doctor will explain, will clarify, verify this for you, that when a fetus or a baby is in the womb of its mother, it receives, that baby receives all kinds of nutrition, all the nutrition it needs, it receives through that cord, you know, the, the, the umbilical cord that, collect, uh, that connects the mother to the child. But not one drop of blood passes from the mother to the child. So Jesus he received all kinds of nutrition from Mary, but, he, but the life in his blood was the life of God. That's why the virgin birth is so important. There are churches that say, well, the virgin birth isn't important. Uh, uh, well, it is, because if it is not important, uh, then if Jesus was born, like if he was conceived like you and I, then he would have the sin of Adam in his blood, and he could not be our savior. So that is why, so Jesus, he was conceived of the word and the spirit of God and he received his humanity, his human body from Mary because he was nine months in her womb. He received his humanity. His body was just as human as you and I. But the life of, of, in his blood was the life of God himself. So here he is, Jesus, living. He lived 33 years on this earth carrying in himself the life of God. The first 30 years he lived in relative obscurity, but the last three and a half years, that's when he preached the gospel, he healed the sick, cast out devils. But throughout all those years, it says, the Bible says, he was tempted in every way but without sin. That means that the devil, he did his best to do to Jesus what he did to Adam and Eve. He tempted him in every every way. Now, let me say something about temptation. Sin comes because of temptation and we are all tempted but we are all tempted by different things. I am tempted in areas of weakness that may not be your areas of weakness and you are tempted in other areas where I am not tempted. So that is why what happens when we hear about somebody who did something bad and our reaction is how could he do such a thing? I would have never done it. And you're right, you would have never done it because that is his area of weakness and not yours. And if you mess up, that same person will say, well, how could she do that? I would never do that thing. That's right, because that's your area of weakness and not his. And that's why 
it's so easy for us as human beings, as Christians, to judge one another. And there's only one thing that can cover sin, and that is love. Love covers a multitude of sins. But what happens is that we judge one another because of this, and, and Jesus is the only one who has ever been tempted in every single area that a human being can be tempted in. And that's why he understands all of us. That is why if you ever mess up, if you ever sin, the worst thing you can do is to leave the church and run away from God because if you do that, you are running away from the only person who loves you no matter what. Do you understand what I'm saying? Don't run away from the only one who loves you unconditionally. And that is Jesus. Because, listen, he understands you. I may not understand you, but he understands you. Never run away from church. Never leave the church. Never, because most people, you know why they leave church? Because it's pride. They, they have lost face. Everyone heard, has heard of what I have done. Or at least I assume everybody knows what I've done. So I don't want to show my face there anymore. It's better. And it's pride. But humble yourself. Humble yourself before God and before man. That's the best thing to do. All right? So here he is, he is, he's tempted in every way. And then when he was 30, he began to preach the gospel. He began to heal the sick and we hear about his ministry. And then after three and a half years of ministry, Jesus comes to a place called Gethsemane. And when he comes to Gethsemane, he kneels down and he begins to pray. And as he is praying, God shows him a cup. And in that cup, he sees the sin, the sins of all mankind. Now, I want you to understand what that is. Right now, there are 8 billion people living on this earth. That is 8,000 million people. Somebody did some calculations, and I read that, and he said, he estimated that from the time of Adam until now, 39 billion people have walked on this earth because the number keeps on multiplying as the population of the earth grows. And then he said, we don't know when Jesus is returning, but when he comes back, you can multiply that even further. So up to now, 139 billion people have lived, plus the multiplied billions who come after us. But the point is that Jesus saw the sins of all these billions of people concentrated into that one cup. Sin is a heavy burden to bear. That's why I am so thankful that I have a savior. Because if I was to sit down, now one thing, listen, that's why God says that he will cleanse away all your sins and he will remember them no more. Never recycle your old, old sins because they will bring you down. It will take away your confidence before God. You know, if I was to sit down and, and just think of the bad things I have done, that in itself would be too big a burden to carry. And I'm just a normal human being like you. But there have been people who have, who have been extraordinarily evil. So you think of the mass murderers, you think of the rapists, you think of the child molesters. I mean, you think of people who do unspeakable things. But, and, and then you, you look at your own life. You think of your big sins, your little sins, your secret sins. You, all of us have done things that we are even ashamed to tell the people closest to us. All of us. And now you think of all that. Of these billions of people, Jesus saw all that in a cup. And the father said to him, Jesus, this is why I have sent you into this world, to drink of every drop of this cup. And Jesus, his, you know, he was so pure. He had this 
wonderful fellowship with the Father from before the beginning of eternity. And, uh, you know, he used to say things like, the Father loves the Son and shows him all things. If you have seen me, you have seen the Father. I and the Father am one. So he had such a wonderful communion with the Father, and he knew what that would do to him. If he drank of that cup, he would lose that communion with the Father. And that was something that was too painful for him to bear. He didn't want to lose that. So from that instinct of self-preservation, he cried out. He said, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass me by. That means, Father, if there's any other, I know I've come to the world to take the sins of the world, but if there's any other way to do it, let's do it that way. But he had another instinct that was greater than his instinct of self-preservation, and that was his love for sinners, his love for you and me. So he said, Father, nevertheless, not mine, but your will be done. I want you to understand how much he loved you and me. When we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He saw us and he said, not mine, but your will be done. And at that moment, he came to, into a deep anguish in his soul and some of his blood vessels burst and he began to sweat drops of blood. After that, the soldiers arrested him and I'm, I'm cutting through a lot of details. They took him to Pilate and Pilate stood there with him and he said to the people, what should we do with him? And they were saying, crucify him, crucify him. These are the same people who had been waving Hosanna to the king a few days before. Now they were against him. And so Pilate gave him to the soldiers and the soldiers took him to a place where they took off his outer garments and the Bible says, you know, that they whipped him. Now that means they took off his outer garments and they tied him up. And those Romans used to have an instrument of torture called a flagrum. A flagrum was a whip. It, it was actually designed to kill people. People used to die being whipped with a flag room. A flag room had nine long belts of ox leather, and each belt of ox leather had sharp pieces of metal and bone. And they began to whip Jesus, and they whipped him, and they whipped him, and they whipped him, and with each cut of that whip, pieces of flesh were torn off his back, and his precious blood began to flow from his back. And, and the psalmist says that plowmen have plowed my back, and they have made long furrows. So his back looked like a field that had been plowed. Now, why was he being whipped? The Bible says, that, the prophet Isaiah says that surely he has borne our diseases and carried our pains and by his wounds, by his stripes, we have been healed. So when Jesus was being whipped, God took all of our diseases. And let's make it personal. God took all of your diseases, your physical diseases, your mental diseases, your emotional diseases, and he put them upon Jesus. Now, some people would say, well, why do you make such a big thing out of healing? There are churches that say, well, God doesn't heal anymore today. Then there's people who say they're Pentecostals. They say, well, okay, we believe in healing, but it's not that important. The important thing is salvation. Now, why do we preach about this? I tell you why. Do you want to know why we make such a big thing out of it? Because Jesus suffered for it. And we study and we see how much he suffered for it. So it must be important for him that you are healed because of the, uh, the extreme price that he paid for you and I to be healed. That's the only reason. I know that salvation is eternal and healing is only for this life, you know, for this body. I know all that and you know all that. But what makes it important is not the duration of the healing and, you know, or, uh, and, and I know that healing doesn't save you. But what makes it important is the price that Jesus Christ, Christ paid when he was whipped and beaten. <coughs> and that is why I cannot be quiet about it. That is why we preach it. 
We teach it, we pray for the sick, and we make it a big thing out of it. And if someone doesn't get healed, we keep on teaching, we keep on preaching, we keep on praying for this, because Jesus paid a price for you to be healed. That's why it's important. That is why it's important. So he says that by his stripes we were healed. Now, he bore our physical diseases, our infirmities when he was being whipped. After that, the Bible says that they crowned him with a thorn of crowns. Uh, a, a, you know, a crown of thorns. Now, thorns in the Bible are symbolic of the curse that is on this earth because of the sin of man. And when Jesus wore that crown of thorns, he was cursed instead of you and me. That is why nobody can curse somebody who God has blessed. Never walk in fear that anyone can ever curse you. Nobody can curse you because Jesus wore the crown of thorns that day. And after that, the Bible says they took sticks and they began to beat him. And they beat him so badly that Isaiah says in the 52nd chapter that his face was disfigured beyond recognition. He was beaten. His face was disfigured beyond recognition. And the Bible says that he was beaten that we might have peace. Peace in our own hearts. You know, you don't need to look at another person to have conflict. You can be conflicted within your own self. Peace in our own hearts. Peace with our fellow man. Peace in our home, in our family. Peace. You look at what is happening in the world today. You think we live in such an enlightened age, yet you then Ukraine, they're killing each other. I did crusades in Ukraine. And, and they told me, oh, we and the Russians, we are like brothers. Because they, many Ukrainians speak Russian and, Russian and people used to cross the border. And many Ukrainians have married Russians and vice versa. And they, they think we are brothers. But today they are killing each other. Then you go to the Middle East, you see the Arabs and the Jews killing each other. You know why? Because they don't have peace. But Jesus says, my peace I give unto you. Because he was beaten so that we might have peace. Then after that, he bore our diseases, carried our pains. He became a curse for us. And they, you know, then they spat upon him. And there he stood covered with blood, covered with the spit of sinners. And they made him carry that cross to Calvary. And as he walked down the streets of Jerusalem carrying that cross, people were mocking him, making fun of him, cursing him. And there they nailed him to the cross. And he hung upon that cross for six long hours, paying for your sins and my sins. The sins of these billions of people were put upon him. And he hung there for six hours. And during the six hours, sometime during the six hours, as he bore the sins of mankind, the very thing that he feared came upon him. He, separ he was separated from the father and he cried out in his anguish. He said, my father, my father, why have you forsaken me? And then he died. And they wanted to make sure he was dead. So one of the soldiers took a spear and shoved it on his side into his heart and water and blood came out and they said that he is dead and there he hung upon the cross dead and his blood flowed down through his wounds and it ran down the cross now here's an amazing thing a human body a normal human body carries about five liters of blood. If you were to drain my body of all my blood or your body, there would be about plus minus five liters of blood. Not far from the place where Jesus was crucified was the temple where daily animals were sacrificed. Animals were sacrificed there every, you know, there was a whole market in the outer court of the temple. There was a market of animals. Were, that was people's business, selling sacrificial animals. And these were hand-picked animals without, I mean, the, there was not one tooth missing. There was no piece of, no fur that was missing. These were animals without mark or blemish. And there were, you know, and thousands of liters of blood 
was shed in that temple. Year after year. Then there was the annual sacrifice when, you know, they, they I, I mean the temple, listen, if you see pictures of the temple depicted by artists, it looks very clean, but the temple was a very bloody place. Tens of thousands of liters of blood were shed at the temple. And that was done year after year after year after year after year. You can imagine the amount of blood that was shed in the temple, yet all that blood never cleansed people from the sin. It just covered their sin for a while. Then it was time for the next sacrifice. Yet when it was time for God to pay to cleanse mankind from all their sins, all he sent was five liters of blood. Billions and billions and billions of people. And God's answer was five liters of blood. That was all Jesus brought into this world. And that five liters of blood was so holy. It was so pure. That the Bible says that the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Hallelujah. Five liters of blood. That was God's answer. To the cries of sinful man. And that blood ran down the cross. And it collected in a pool on the ground at the foot of the cross. And a trickle of blood began to flow down that hill. And that was the day when God kept his promise. There shall be a stream of blood that shall cleanse the people from sin and uncleanness. It's not a river of blood. It is just a tiny stream. But that stream flows as warm and as fresh today as it did 2,000 years ago. You know why? Because the Bible says we have not been purchased by corruptible things. And corruptible means things that can lose their efficacy, like old medicine, you know, when its date of expiry is gone. It's still good for some time, but it loses its efficacy, it loses its power. And, the, and, and so uh, anything that can, go, that can go stale, that can, whose power can diminish or it becomes tarnished or it can lose its shine. Those are things that are corruptible. So he said, we have not been bought by corruptible things like, you know, silver or gold or the precious things of this earth, but we have been bought by the precious blood of Jesus. That means that blood of Jesus is so holy that it is still as warm and as fresh today as it was 2,000 years ago. And that is the reason I Every single day I plead the blood of Jesus over myself and my family because it's a daily cleansing. Hallelujah. It gives us life every day. The blood of Jesus. It strengthens us. It gives us life every single day. Now, the blood of Jesus is saving blood. Ephesians 1 Verse 7 says, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace. Redemption means we have been purchased through his blood. When I gave my life to Jesus on the 13th of December, 1975, I was purchased by his blood. I wasn't just cleansed and let loose to do my own thing, but he purchased me. He bought me with his blood. So my life is no longer my own. I belong to Jesus. He owns me. Hallelujah. That is why you will never hear me talk about my rights. I don't have many rights. But he is my rights. Jesus is everything. The blood of Jesus is healing blood. When his blood ran down his back after he was being whipped, he bore all my diseases, carried all my pains and infirmities, and by his stripes I've been healed. Amen. 
The blood of Jesus brings deliverance. Colossians 2.15 says that having disarmed the powers and the principalities, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them at the cross. At the cross, Jesus destroyed the works of the devil once and for all. Hallelujah. The blood of Jesus speaks for us at the altar. It says in Hebrews 12, 24, And to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. When Jesus rose from the dead, he ascended to heaven. He took his blood and put it at the altar in the presence of God. And that blood speaks because that blood is alive. It's full of life. It speaks your name. It speaks my name. It intercedes. It speaks for us. It speaks salvation for you. It speaks forgiveness for you. It speaks healing for you. It speaks lives for you and your family the blood of Jesus speaks even today hallelujah amen and the blood of Jesus gives us access to the presence of God Hebrews 10 19 20 therefore brothers since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus we have the right and the confidence to enter the presence of God by the blood of Jesus. Hallelujah. You know some of us think that, think that the presence of God is a nice feeling we get when there's good worship. You know good music playing and we get that emotional thing and we think that's the presence of God. And when you leave the building that presence is gone. You know. Let me tell you something about the presence of God. The blood brings us to the presence of God. When I got saved, I didn't know much about anything. But the first thing I learned was how Jesus had shed his blood for me. I spent my 22nd birthday in prison for preaching the gospel. In a horrible prison cell. I was almost a whole year in prison. And I remember thinking one day, you know, I came from a good family and I had everything set in life and I have lost everything. And I remember sitting in prison one day. I was a new believer, you have to understand this. And I was asking God, I said, God, people make mistakes and most of the mistakes you make, you can always correct them, you know. But there are certain mistakes, you, you know, they stay with you forever. And I said, I've made many mistakes in my life. But this one, giving my life to Jesus and losing everything in the process. I'm in prison now. My own family has cut me off. I've lost my money, lost my position. When I come out of prison, if I come out of here alive, I will have nothing. And I said, Lord, I need to know. Because if this whole thing about following Jesus is another one of my foolish mistakes, then I have lost everything. But... If Jesus truly died on the cross for me, if he's risen from the dead and he is alive today and the Bible is true and this thing is real, then I have gained everything. But I, will, I needed to know. All I knew, Jesus shed his blood for me and I, I said, Lord, I need to know. And there in that presence, right then, I can't describe it. It was like there was, a, there was a mist or a fog that came into my room. And I had this little wooden cot and that bed began to shake. And the presence of God filled me. And that was so real. I still remember it like it was yesterday. But that was, that was my goodness, that was 1976, 48 years ago. And that was the day. God sealed my heart and I knew and they said to me unless you go back to Islam you're going to die in this prison and I said if I die in this prison I know where I'm going but you don't know where you're going the presence of God seals your life for Jesus 
So if you ever mess up, you're quick to repent because you don't want to lose the hand of God upon your life and you, you, you just carry on, you just walk on. Are you with me? Thank God for the blood of Jesus. Thank God for the blood of Jesus. Let's bow our heads together. I'm out of time. While our heads are bowed, I just want to ask if there's anybody here. You say, Pastor Christopher, I need to get right with God. I want my, need my sins to be forgiven. Or you say, I don't know whether I'm saved. But I want Jesus. I want my, I want to be cleansed by his blood. I need to make things right with God. If that is you, let me see your hand right now because I want to pray with you. If you need to make things right with God, you need your sins to be forgiven or you need to be saved. Lift your hand high enough so that I can see it if there's anybody like that. God bless you. Anybody else? Anybody? Quickly, quickly. Lift your hand up. God bless you right there. God bless you right there. I just want to make sure I get all of you because I don't want you going back home without knowing that your name is written in the book in heaven if there's anybody else okay God bless you God bless you I just want to make sure okay those of you God bless you right there if you put your hand up please stand to your feet please stand to your feet just stand to your feet if you put your hand up please stand to your feet God bless you Pastor Walker can I have five more minutes now those of you who are standing up could you come and join me right here I want to pray with you just come join me just come and join me Thank you, Jesus. Please come and join me. Please come and join me. God bless you. Just make a line here. Praise God. Join me. And if there's anybody still sitting down and your heart is saying to you that I shouldn't be sitting down, but I should be standing in front with these people, this is your opportunity to get up and come if you are not saved but you say I need to be saved Pastor Christopher you need to get right with God just come join me right now this is your opportunity thank you Jesus thank you Jesus thank you Jesus okay lift up your hands to God lift up your hands to God and please pray after me say Lord Jesus I thank you that you shed your blood upon the cross and that you died for me, taking my place, taking my sins upon your own self. Lord, I come to you this morning and I give my life to you. Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart and live in my heart. And I acknowledge you as my Lord. I turn my back to the world and I will walk with you. Put your hand upon my life. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Please put your hand down. Hands down. I want to tell you something. You know, when you pray a prayer like this, you can easily go back to your old life if you want to. I've seen many people you know, Jesus said something interesting. He said, even a dog will not return to its old vomit. We are better than dogs. We, we, we don't want to go back to the old life. So when, when you pray a prayer like this, it's like sowing a seed. And there's four things. If you do these four things, you will see huge changes in your life in the next couple of months. The first thing is read the Bible every day. Okay? Read the Bible every day. Because when, when, when you, if you say, where shall I read? Start reading. It's a big book. It's my advice, personal advice. This is what I did. Start with the Gospel of John because it's the easiest to understand. Read the Bible every day. When you read the Bible, your faith will increase and God will speak to you. The, you know, the Bible is a miraculous book. When you read the Bible, God actually begins to talk to you. Secondly, talk to Jesus every day. We call it prayer, but for many people, prayer is a ritual. It's not a ritual. It's it's, it's you talking to God like a child speaks to its father. Okay? Talk to Jesus every day. Even about little or big problems or issues in your life. Talk to Jesus. Third, 
share your faith with others. Tell your friends that, hey, I gave my life to Jesus. I was in church and I gave my life to Jesus. That's what I did when I first got saved. The fourth thing is be in church. Come to church. Because I tell you why I started going to church. You know, coming from a Muslim family, I'd never been to church. I'd never met a Christian. But when I met these believers, I thought, man, these people have something that I want. I want to be like them. Because I realized, like you do, because the reason you came here, you're not really happy with your life. Isn't it true? If you were perfectly satisfied with your life, you wouldn't be here. And that's why I gave my life to Jesus. I was suicidal. My life was a mess. But when I saw these people who knew Jesus, I saw that they had something that I did not have and I wanted it badly. So you begin to, you know, and this is why I begin to come to church. You, 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 you develop a whole new uh, kind of relationships and you hear the word of God and people pray for you and those are life changing factors you come to church you're, it's a life changing factor okay so read the bible talk to Jesus share your faith with others and be in church every Sunday be here next Sunday I won't be here but be here next Sunday would you take them aside could you follow this gentleman just, he'll just take you aside for a couple of minutes okay. now the last thing I want to do, I want to pray. If you, if you have any sickness, any issue in your body, could you just stand up right where you are? If you've got any sickness or any, anything you want prayer for, just stand up where you are. Okay. Now, put your hand on the spot where your disease is. If you've got a deaf ear, stick your finger into the deaf ear. got a blind eye, put your hand on your blind eye. You've got a tumor, wherever your disease is, put your hand on the spot and I'll pray for you. Father God, we come to your presence in the name of your holy son, Jesus, who was whipped and bruised and beaten and crucified for us, bearing upon himself all of our diseases, carrying all our sins, and by whose stripes we were healed. And Lord, you said, whatsoever we shall ask you, ask the Father in the name of Jesus, it shall be done. So Father, I ask you to send down the holy healing anointing from heaven upon each one of my brothers and sisters. Touch them at the point of need in their lives. Heal them in the name of Jesus. I curse every tumor, every cancer, every infirmity in their bodies in the name of Jesus. I command these deaf ears to be open. Father, restore their sight. I curse every cataract and eye disease. Father, if there's any injury in their body, any internal disease, Whatever is wrong, I ask you to heal them right now. I touch you with the precious blood of Jesus. And I speak to your body and I say, Be healed in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, the Son of God. Jesus Christ heals you now in Jesus' name. I thank you, Father. Lift up your hands to God. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your grace upon each one of these precious people. Our brothers and sisters, I thank you. I thank you. Now begin to thank God. While you Just begin to thank God with your mouth. Say, Father, I thank you. Pastor Walker, you could come over. Just begin to thank the Lord for what you have received. Just thank God. Just thank the Lord. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you. We bless you. Thank you for the blood of Jesus that speaks of better things, of our deliverance, of our forgiveness, of our healing. Father, thank you for these bodies are restored in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Hallelujah. So before we go today, we have a, a wonderful opportunity to share in this ministry. The Romans chapter 10 says, how can the gospel be, be preached without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? The crusades that Pastor Chris and his team, great, great team, as he said, is based in Harare. The, how many know sinners don't pay for crusades? We pay for crusades. We send the gospel. And, and at Miracle Life, we do that in a variety of ways. But we have these opportunities that we can do throughout the year when we have guest speakers, especially those that are, that are on the front lines of evangelism and, and ministry like this. So we're going to pray over this offering and just allow God to speak to you. And many, many times he'll, he'll give you a, a specific amount. He'll, he'll impress on you something to give. I, he's done that with my wife and I 
many, many, many times over the years. But if he doesn't, just be generous. And we want to make mention that all of our, our giving options, most of you give electronically. You can give electronically for this special offering as well. But when you do, there'll be a memo that you just put Alam. Chris, that's Pastor Chris's last name, A-L-A-M. Just put Alam when you give, and then uh, our accounts folks will make sure that gets directed to the right way. Otherwise, there will be um, baskets on our way out um, with uh, every door where we're going to be dismissed today. If you would like to have a specific on offering envelope, if you've got a, a cash or a check you want to put that in, just raise up your hand. Our ushers will, will do that for you, and you'll, you'll see their special offering, guest speaker. Just circle that. Uh, and you can designate your giving that way if you have cash or check. I don't know if anybody has checks anymore. Um, I, I, they're stuck in my drawer at home I, I, collecting dust. But uh, if, if you do, that's fine too. You can use that um, offering envelope. And all of the, the offering as we are collecting on our way out will go to uh, Pastor Chris's team and the, the great ministry that they're doing around this part of the world. Amen. All right, so we're going to pray over the offering. We'll dismiss as well. And I know many of you received prayer for healing today, but maybe you say there's other areas of my life. I've got a burden. There's a family issue. I'm facing a decision. Um, I don't know what to do or where to go. Um, there's folks up front, our, our, he, our, sorry, our care team. They love you so much, and they would love to be able to minister to you. And so as you're dismissed, uh, don't go out the back. But just come up um, front, and we would love to be able to have the opportunity to care for you, minister to you, and, and agree with God's promises over your life. Amen? Um, one last thing. Uh, this message will be in the bookshop. It'll, you can also download it this week on our website. This is a message I truly believe some of you need to hear over and over and over again. Some of even where, where you've been tormented, where you've got thoughts from your past, allow the power of the blood of Jesus to cleanse you and to help you. If you've got some mental issues or depression, things like that, just listen to this on a daily basis. Amen. Put it on your phone and allow the, the truth of God to, to affect your heart. Amen. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for the precious blood of Jesus. And Father, those of us that are born again, Lord, we have a very, very high price tag on our life. Because the blood of Jesus is valuable, Father, that means we're valuable to you. We're expensive. And Father, thank you, Lord, even though other people may have devalued our life or spoken down to us, Father, Lord, you lift us because of the blood of Jesus. And we're precious to you, Father, and we see ourselves in that same way. Father, go with us as we are dismissed. Make us a great, great blessing to everyone we come in contact this week. We love you so much. In your name we pray. Amen. 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 We love you. You are dismissed. We're going to be dismissed from the back to the front if you'd allow us to do that. We love you so much, and we'll see you next week. God bless.